I had first come across the story of Philip Hosanna in 2008 in Gerald Shaw's book Believe in Miracles, which tracks his experiences reporting on South Africa over five decades. I never forgot it. For not only did this story paint such a vivid picture, but it is also one of those largely forgotten South African stories which I found myself surprised at never having heard before. The story begins at Philippi Police Station on the outskirts of Cape Town on a Monday morning, March 21st, 1960. An infamous day. Shaw had arrived at the police station to cover a developing story. On arrival, he observed a line of people queuing into the distance, orderly, but on such a scale that the back of the queue snaked right out of sight. They had intentionally left their passbooks at home and, in an act of protest, they were now presenting themselves for arrest. Shaw records how a fellow journalist at the station had, on this explanation, asked, what is a pass? And in those four words, and the question mark that followed them, lurked so much of the South African tragedy. For those passbooks should have been right at the very core of our national conversation. They were, in a sense, a physical remnant of Europe's expansion into the New World four centuries before. Because Europe had brought with them guns, germs and steel, to quote Jared Diamond, the combination of which had secured Europeans' land right across the New World, often in great abundance. However, securing the necessary labour to leverage these new colonies would prove to be a far greater challenge, particularly for those colonies driving new labour-intensive industries like sugar and mining. And so arose this curious scenario, whereby Europe was increasingly short on land but teeming with labour, whereas its colonies faced the exact converse. Many colonies responded by importing or developing legally ring-fenced classes of labour, which importantly enabled careful control over their rights and, of particular relevance for this story, their movements, indentured servitude, convict labour and, most notoriously, slavery. Accordingly, many of these colonies emerged as wildly unequal societies, divided sharply into ruling and labour classes, divisions which were often further exacerbated by race. But while many of these colonies were beginning to integrate and to return slowly to a degree of normalcy by the 19th century, in South Africa, diamonds and gold, only discovered in the late 19th century, were instead further entrenching social division and labour controls. And these would persist deep into the 20th century, where they were being calcified into race politics. And following the National Party's victory in 1948, South Africa was to diverge yet further from global trends, for their new policy of apartheid served to iron out any remaining grey areas of race-divided politics. It was to be acute in its detail and ruthless in its intensity. And a core element of the apartheid system involved influx controls. For the African peoples, these took the form of an updated set of pass laws, a system legally implemented in 1952 whereby African people would effectively be required to apply for temporary visas within their own country, and then to carry those visa booklets at all times in order to avoid arrest. These were the hated passbooks, the so-called Dompas. Understandably, their introduction sparked immediate protest. The defiance campaign of that year, and then the famous Women's March of 1956, had both taken direct aim at the Dompas. And by late 1959, with the treason trial now all but done and defeated, it was clear that the government would face another round of these protests. For both the ANC and their newly spun-off political rival, the Pan-Africanist Congress, the PAC, had signalled their intent to target the passbooks again in 1960. The PAC had been founded by an impressive young man hailing from Graf Renette, called Robert Subukwe. Subukwe had made waves as the president of the SRC at the University of Fort Hare, where he had joined the ANC Youth League in 1948. He subsequently became a teacher and a newspaper editor before lecturing in African studies at the University of the Witwatersrand. Like Mandela, six years his senior, Subukwe was a student of Gandhi, believing in the transformative power of mass civil disobedience. 
However, as a firm Africanist, he had become disillusioned with the ANC, notably its non-African communist element. And in April 1959, he officially founded the PAC. His slogan was Africa for Africans. Although being a strong believer in non-racialism, Sobukwe defined African as being anyone with an allegiance to the soil of Africa. That said, his first priority, understandably, was black liberation, and the past books would be his natural first target. The PAC's campaign, planned for that Monday morning, March 21st, was to apply Gandhi's principles in order to disempower the past laws, non-adherence on a mass scale, and then demanding arrest at one's local police station under the slogan, no defense, no bail, no fine. The ANC, it should be noted, had plans for a similar protest later that month, which impacted the PAC turnout in several areas. However, in two pockets of South Africa, the PAC's call was to be heeded on a significant scale. One was in the Greater Vaal area, south of Johannesburg, including the growing industrial towns of Vereniging and Van der Bale Park, between which lay the township of Schafel. The other was at Philippi, on the outskirts of Cape Town, where the PAC was under the leadership of regional chairman Christopher Mflokoti and the young lieutenant Philip Hosana. It was here that Gerald Shaw had arrived that morning to cover the story. Slowly and orderly, that queue in Philippi moved through, with each of the non-adherents told that they would be summoned to court in due course. They never were, of course. That would have been impossible. Remarkably, in the space of one peaceful Monday morning, past laws in the Western Cape had been rendered unenforceable. The PAC now announced a community meeting in Langa at 6 p.m. that afternoon to consolidate their position. Little did they know, the whole scenario was about to change dramatically and forever. Because at the matching protest in Sharpville, tragedy had struck. At 20 past one that afternoon, the police had panicked and opened fire on the protest as resulting in a significant loss of life. And news of this calamity was now spreading rapidly across the country, leaving South Africa balancing on a knife's edge. Fearing spiraling levels of unrest, the police in Cape Town decided to disperse that planned 6 p.m. gathering in Langa by force, just as the opening prayers were being observed, a provocation which sparked protest action into that Monday night, costing three lives. Two protesters had been shot, and then a driver for the Cape Times, whose body was discovered in his car that evening by a young Cape Times reporter called Tony Hurd. South Africa awoke on the Tuesday morning to a different world a land enveloped in fear and anger and mourning. In one sense, this change had been inevitable, as observed by the British Prime Minister Harold Macmillan, whose famous Winds of Change speech had been delivered just a month before in Cape Town's Parliament. But just how powerful that wind would be, or how quickly it would arrive, could not have been predicted. For the weeks that now followed would forever change this country. Robert Sobukwe had been arrested at the equivalent protest at Orlando police station in Soweto. He was subsequently charged with incitement and sentenced to three years in prison. His political career forever stifled, but that is a whole story to its own. Then in Cape Town, a stay away was immediately called and heeded on a mass scale despite police attempts to break it. The city was brought to a standstill. On the Friday, March 25th, about 100 protesters under a PAC regional organiser Wilson Manetzi now made their way to the Caledon Square police station in Cape Town where, in protest, they offered themselves up for arrest. This time, with more manageable numbers, the police duly obliged. On Sunday, March 27th, Oliver Tumbo skipped the country in anticipation of a sharp clampdown, carrying with him instructions from the ANC to establish new structures in exile. On Monday the 28th, the funeral for the two victims shot in Langa was held. It was attended remarkably by some 50,000 people. And just like the queue outside the police station one week before, it was meticulously organized and peaceful. A day of mourning followed on Tuesday the 29th. With these events unfolding rapidly, Gerald Shaw now arranged to meet Philip Hosanna in order to discuss the ongoing campaign. Kosana had been born in Makapanstadt, an hour's drive north of Pretoria. 
He was schooled at Lady Selborne where his intelligence had seen him earn a bursary to study commerce at the University of Cape Town. But such was the force of political injustice at that time, Hosanna gave up his studies and instead accepted an opportunity to become the regional secretary of the PAC in the Western Cape. During his meeting with Shaw, Hosanna explained the purpose of the PAC's campaign, reiterating his dedication to non-violent, orderly protests. But he also told Shaw that something big was about to unfold, something which was to make the whole country sit up and take notice. Shaw would not have to wait for long. The very next morning, on Wednesday, March 30th, came reports of an extraordinary development. Tens of thousands of people were streaming out of Langa and walking slowly towards Cape Town's southern suburbs. They were being marshaled by Philip Hosanna, who in the absence of the now-arrested Christopher Mklokoti had inherited the regional leadership of the PAC. He was just 23 years old, dressed in an old school blazer and shorts. The marchers motioned past Rondebosch Common and onto Mowbray, then up the hill onto Duval Drive before winding their way down towards Cape Town's city centre. No one knew the final destination, although the prevailing fear was that they were heading towards Parliament, which was then in session and under heavy protection. And given the tensions following Sharpville just nine days prior, here emerged a very dangerous scenario. As the column closed in on Cape Town, Hosanna was focused, impressive, and in full control. An extraordinary accomplishment given his age. He was sending runners off in various directions with messages and instructions for the marchers, who by account remained in near total silence as they walked. Although at one point an overzealous marcher ran ahead, shouting his intent to burn Parliament down. Tony Heard records how Hosanna quickly hitched a ride in their newspaper car before hopping out and reprimanding the dissident back into line. On reaching the bottom of Duval Drive, the marchers followed the road as it curls down to the right and merges onto Ruland Street, which then flows straight down into central Cape Town. They were now heading directly towards Parliament, which was about one kilometre away. News of the march was spreading, and the column continued to gather people and momentum. It makes for an extraordinary sight. Tens of thousands of protesters compacted into the streets. With the atmosphere that fateful Wednesday further heightened by the sound of a circling Air Force helicopter. And still they continued to close in on Parliament. Tension was mounting. However, just a few hundred metres before reaching Parliament, the column turned right into Batenkant Street and they made their way instead to Caledon Square Police Station, where Wilson Manetzi's group of protesters had been arrested the previous Friday. Hosanna, having carefully managed the flow of marches, eventually made his way to the focal point at the entrance of the police station. Here he would be met by Colonel I.P.S. Terblanche. Hosanna, backed by the tremendous energy of those who had heeded the call, now demanded both the release of all those people arrested during the course of that week, as well as an urgent meeting with the Minister of Justice. Colonel Terblanche, however, indicated that the minister was at lunch and was therefore not available. However, he offered Hosanna his assurance that if he marched the protesters peacefully out of the city, he would arrange for a meeting with the minister for which Hosanna could return later that afternoon. Boyd, Hosanna accepted this arrangement, and then, in a quite magnificent show of leadership and discipline, Hosanna now led the column uneventfully out of the city, back along Duval Drive and then all the way back into Langa. This may seem like an unlikely outcome for such a powerful protest, but given the greater context, this was considered to be a significant win. For in 1960, activists could not simply demand a meeting with the Minister of Justice, yet the might of this protest had enabled just that. However, even as the protesters were slowly exiting the city, the state was already in a process of response, and it was to be brutal. A state of emergency was immediately declared, and when Hosanna did arrive back at Caledon Square for his promised meeting, he was summarily arrested. That interview with the minister never took place. Instead, Philip Hosanna found himself in confinement, 
One can only imagine what must have been going through his mind. And still the trauma continued. That Friday, April 1st, a child was killed at a roadblock in Nyanga, which had resulted in church bells ringing throughout Cape Town's townships. This was the incident which inspired Ingrid Jonker's famous and moving poem, The Child Is Not Dead. The following Friday, April 8th, the ANC and the PAC were both formally banned, so officially driving the struggle movement underground. And the very next day at the Rand Easter show in Johannesburg, Prime Minister Hendrik Verwurt was shot twice by David Pratt, who had taken aim, in his words, at the epitome of apartheid. Verwurt survived. When Philip Rosana was released, he now found himself under careful scrutiny. His political party was banned and his ability to lead severely curtailed. So he made the painful decision to go into exile in Ethiopia. A man with extraordinary talent and leadership lost to the country observed Helen Sussman. Accordingly, Hosanna would spend most of his productive years out of the country. For many years, he worked for UNICEF in Uganda, Tanzania, Sri Lanka and India, earning international recognition for his contributions. He finally returned back to South Africa in 1996, after almost four decades in exile. Back home, he continued to drive community and political initiatives. On March 30th, 2016, the 56th anniversary of his famous march, and now 79-year-old Philip Hosanna, who had personally commemorated March 30 as a sacred day every year since 1960, now formally retraced his steps out of Langa. And accompanied by supporters, they made their way along the beautiful Duval Drive before winding down into the city which had changed the course of his life so dramatically. Walking alongside Philip Hosanna that day, in solidarity, was a man called Nastr Blanche, the 74-year-old son of the late Colonel I.P. Esther Blanche. Many who listen to this story instinctively believe they understand Colonel de Blanche, the villain who had tricked Hosanna into dispersing the crowds only to arrest him later that day. But what I have found over time about South African stories is that there is very often great reward in scratching through the obvious and exploring instead the human context behind characters on the other side, those who have been brushed off by history. Colonel I.P. Esther Blanche, known as Terry, had been born to an ostrich and mohair farm near Uniondale in 1903, the seventh of 11 children. At the age of 10, a collapse in feather prices saw the family farm ruined. They left that farm together with fading memories of a comfortable upbringing. He completed school to standard eight, although later completing matric while studying at night as a young policeman in Pretoria. He dedicated his entire career to the police, moving to Cape Town with the force in the 1950s. And that fateful day in March of 1960 would also be a pivotal moment in his life. It was about midday on the Wednesday when he had received a call from a senior officer at Caledon Square Police Station requesting urgent help. Terry made his way to the station, and on arrival, the seriousness of the situation was immediately evident. Here was a tinderbox. Sharpville had unfolded just nine days prior, and Ter Blanche realized how easily Caledon Square could have become just as notorious, perhaps even more so considering the numbers. He immediately ordered all armed policemen to be out of sight and all the shops in the area to be closed. Terry then looked to engage with the crowd, but the message he received was that the leaders who were still organizing the marches around them were not yet available. Now came a message that there was a phone call waiting for him inside the police station, apparently someone very senior. Ted Blanche obliged, returning into the station to find the Minister of Justice on the line. In his memoirs, Terry, out of respect, does not explicitly state the nature of the instructions he now received. Instead, he invites his readers to fill the gap by describing how, on placing down the handset, he paused for a moment before dropping to his knees. A 58-year-old man torn between duty and conscience, seeking guidance from the force that he trusted most. He then rose and exited the police station accompanied by two fellow officers, all three unarmed. Philip Hosanna had by then arrived and the reporter Tony Heard was also on the scene. 
Gentleman to gentleman, Sir Blanche opened to Hosanna. His reconciliatory tone was clear. He listened to Hosanna's demands before offering his assurance about a meeting with the minister that afternoon. Terry, of course, failed to secure that meeting. The minister rejected it, straight. Nastur Blanche described his father Terry as a strict but fair man who never came to terms with the fact that he had given his word, that he had effectively betrayed Philip Hosanna. History will find that Terblanche and Hosanna had both acted admirably under the circumstances, that they had avoided a very real potential tragedy and agreed on the spot to a practical next step. However, these were far from ordinary times, and Terry Terblanche would instead be heavily scolded by powers within the police force, for he had done the unthinkable, defied orders. It cost him. He would never receive another promotion in active service and he would never have the opportunity to meet Philip Hosanna again. Promotion did eventually come, but only 27 years later, as a retired man of 84. The wrong that was done to me has been righted, said Terry to Blanche at the time. He died the following year. In 2016, a then 79-year-old Tony Hurd, who had been reporting on the ground during those fateful weeks, but was later the editor of the Cape Times, put forward a proposal that Duval Drive be renamed Philip Hosanna Drive in honor of his contribution. Hosanna's son, Mokhlabani, said his father had been deeply honored by the proposal. Sadly, however, Philip Hosanna would never see the proposal approved, for he passed away on the 19th of April 2017, aged 80, just a year after retracing the steps of his famous march. Here was a remarkable man. In a letter of condolence to the Hosanna family, Nasser Blanche reinforced what an honor it had been to meet Philip Hosanna, that he was a brave, honest, and kind man, and that his own father, Terry, had always carried a great respect for Philip Hosanna's leadership. Four months after Philip Hosanna's death, in August of 2017, at a full council meeting of the city of Cape Town, Tony Hurd's proposal was unanimously approved. That beautiful, winding road with its panoramic views down over Cape Town and the waterfront was now officially Philip Hosanna Drive.